Shalom Aleichem, Erev Tov. We are on page 353. Maran writes, Ahalacha, hey, im kadam uberach zukef kifufim. If a person says the blessing of zukef kifufim, who straightens the bent over, kodem shivarech matir asurim, before he recites the blessing of who frees those who are tied, captive. Lo yivarechena, you should just skip this blessing. Meaning, certain blessings have to be said in order because they happen in order. That's what Maran tells us here. This brings us to a fascinating halakha on page 356. This one will inevitably make some of you irritated and others not. You'll do with this information what you wish. Yesh no hagin. Some have a custom. Levarech, to recite the blessing, Hanoten layaef koach, who gives strength to the tired. Ve'en divrehen nirin, says Maran, and their words do not seem to be correct. Haga'a says the Ramam, Achamin hag pashut, but it's a simple custom, Bivne Ashkenazim Noma among the Ashkenazim to recite this blessing. So according to Maran Ashukhan Aruch, even though there is a minhag to recite Hanoten Laev Koach, he doesn't agree. And the Rama says, but the Ashkenazim have a custom to say this blessing. In your Sephardic Sidu, does it have the blessing Hanoten Laev Koach? Mine does too. What about yours? So what about Maran? Kiban Nuhorot Maran, we accept the rulings of Maran. What about that? <coughs> Your Ashkenazi Siddur School has it too. That's right, because Ashkenazim said this blessing. Let's read. Afal Pish Ladat Maran Ashukhan Aruch on page 356. Even though, according to the opinion of Maran, and the varech bekat hanoten ayef koach, you should not say this blessing of hanoten ayef koach. Mikom makom, nonetheless, pashat haminhag bechol tefutot Yisrael, the custom has spread among all the Jewish exiles, the varech beracha zo b'shem malchut, to recite this blessing with Hashem's name, and with malchut, melech haolam. Why? V'chen da'at rabbeinu harizal, it is the opinion of the harizal, v'rabotenu hamekubanim. And our Kabbalistic rabbis. You should not be concerned that you are saying Hashem's name in vain. It's a rule in our hand. That wherever there is a custom to say a blessing, we don't say, when in doubt, do not make the blessing. We usually have a rule. The rule says, when you have a safik, you have a doubt whether you should make a bracha or not, then you don't say the blessing, because it's erring on the side of caution. You don't want to say HaKadosh Baruch name in vain. But they say, no, here, because there is a minhag, wherever there is a minhag, we're not concerned that the bracha is a blessing of Hashem's name in vain, which is fascinating. Because this comes from the same people, the children of Chacham Yosef, who are always telling other people who have a minhag to say a beracha and not in accordance with Shulchan Aruch, that they are saying Hashem's name in vain. An example. Give me an example where Maran seems to say not to say a blessing, and some Sephardim say a blessing, and the family of Chacham of Adi Yosef says, no, you have to say the blessing the way we do, or else you're saying the Hashem's name in vain. I mean, don't say the blessing. Very good, thank you. The bracha on the halal of Rosh Chodesh. The Rambam writes very clearly that there, we don't say a bracha in half halal. Maran brings a number of opinions in this regard. In the North African Jewish community, the minhag was across the board to recite a blessing on half halal on Rosh Chodesh. The Adliko, yes. Along comes Chacham Wadi Yosef, Alam Shalom, and he says, No, you're not allowed to say this bracha, it's Hashem's name in vain. Oh, you have a minhag? Who cares about your minhag? 
But here, you're saying that the minhag trumps Maran regarding this blessing, Hanatan Le'ef Koch. Tell me another place where there's a minhag. Yeah. Where Chacham Yosef says that you're saying the name in vain. Tell me. Are you talking about candle lighting, whether you say the candle lighting or not? Why Shekhyanu? By Shekhyanu. Whether by Kiddush or by Kiddush, exactly. I'm thinking of Shabbat candles. Tell me, what's the mean hag among many, many, many women? Before or after? Maran said you have to say it before. The minhag seems to be to say it afterwards. We say it before, don't worry. But what about the minhag? The minhag should push off this idea of the bracha. By, by a minhag, we're not worried about brachot of atana. And here you find, yet again, an inconsistency in the Sephardic approach of Chacham Udeh Yosef. The same Chacham Udeh Yosef who waged a war that you have to say the blessing before you light the candles, didn't wage the same war by Nitilat Yadayim, that you have to say the blessing before you wash your hands. In fact, his son, in the volume of this book that's relevant, brings dozens and dozens and dozens of Chachamim who say you say the blessing after you wash your hands. Because where there's a minhag, we don't worry about Brachal Avatara. If that's the truth, the Moroccan Jews should be able to say, a blessing on Halal. Ah, but it goes against Maran. What you're saying right now goes against Maran also. Maran says, don't say the blessing of Hanoten Le'ayif Koach. Ah, so why are you making the bracha? Because of the minhag. And because of the Mkubalim. By the way, by the way, this bracha, leads to much debate regarding the role of Kabbalah in the ruling of Halakha. Because what do you see here? You see a machloket between who and who? Maran and Mkubalim. And who wins? In this case, the Mkubalim. How does that work? What about the rule that whenever there's an argument between Halakha and Kabbalah, you follow? Uh, whenever there's a machloket between Halakha and Kabbalah, you follow? Halakha. So, how could it be here that the Mekubalim trump the Puskim? This leads the Ben Ishchai to write that if there's a doubt, Maran says to say a blessing, but there are poskim who argue. Do you say the blessing or not? No. That's what Sfaradim say. Because we listen to Maran unless there's a doubt of Safek Barachot, a doubt about blessings in front of him. But here you learn that if the Arizal says to say a blessing and the poskim argue with him, who do you follow? Based on this, that's how Cham, uh, Mordechai Yaw held the Ben Shchai. This is their camp. That they follow the Arizal over Maran. That if Maran were to see the words of the Arizal, he would have retracted what he said. <sighs> that's a very dangerous argument to say what somebody would say if they were here. Maybe he would say not. Right, maybe he would. I don't know. You have a guarantee. A lot of places in Hichot Tefillah, especially. Barachut Hashem Mevorach, at the end of Shacharit, the Faradim say, an extra Barachut Hashem Mevorach. 
Maran writes, you only say that on a day where there's no Torah reading. But on a day where there's a Torah reading, there's enough Baruch Hashem Mubarak that you don't, you don't have to say that. Anyway, Svaradim says, There are more consequential things. Wearing tefillin and chol hamoed. Maran says you don't wear tefillin and chol hamoed. His source? His source? No, Ashkenazim wear tefillin and chol hamoed. Real Ashkenazim wear tefillin and chol hamoed. What you know are Hasidic Ashkenazim. They don't count. They're not real Ashkenazim. They are, uh, no, they are newborn Ashkenazim. There's different reform movements that came out of Ashkenaz. Orthodoxy, Hasidut, Reform Jewry, Conservative Jewry, all the, uh, Hasidut is one of the reform movements of Ashkenaz. Real Ashkenazim wear tefillin a cholamoyed. When I was in Baltimore, a cholamoyed, they wore tefillin. Why would you not wear tefillin a Maran says the Zohar says not to wear tefillin, so he rules not to wear tefillin. Technically, what you see here is we're foregoing a biblical commandment to follow the Zohar. Maran is saying that. Correct. Rabbi Yosef Kampach and his notes on the Rambam says that in Yemen they did not wear tefillin achol and that he's uncertain of whether or not this custom predates the Kabbalistic influence in Yemen or not. Meaning, have Yemenite Jews always not worn tefillin on Chol HaMoed? Or was it only from when the Shulchan Aruch began infiltrating Yemen that they stopped wearing tefillin? He, said he doesn't know. But he says something interesting. He said he doesn't have proof whether the Rambam would say yes to wear tefillin or not to wear tefillin. There are some who are adamant that the Rambam says you have to wear tefillin on Chol HaMoed. But Rav Kapach was not convinced. And Av Kapach says, therefore, that you fall back on the minhag, which was not to wear tefillin. It had nothing to do with the Zohar. Av Kapach tells a story that in his grandfather's Berakneset, one of the diehard, let's call him a Rambamist, he came wearing tefillin in Cholam And Mori Hayashish, the old Rav Kapach, the grandfather, he asked the man to leave. He said, never did they, never did they consider not wearing tefillin in It's not a thing. And therefore he asked them to leave so as not to disturb the peace of the kila. The chida is the one who says that if Maran would have seen the words of Darizal, he would retract his words. Let's just say that this is a really big war that you don't want to stick your head into. I could maybe try to justify this beracha for you this way. You find in the writing of some geonim this blessing. Not geonim, mechila. By some of the rishonim. So really by the rishonim, the tool, for example, says that this blessing is part of Berkot HaShacha. So it could be that there are some people who believe that this blessing predates Maran's disagreement of it. Either way, though, Maran says not to say the blessing. The Savardim say this blessing, despite the fact that Maran says not to, because the Arizal always trumps Maran in their eyes. Now, it could be that the Spanish-Portuguese don't say this blessing. I don't have a Spanish-Portuguese seed over here. I have one at home. I'll check. Uh, I don't have anyone on the call who would know. Maybe. I don't know. I think in the same Sidurim that says, you know, I know ten the Aikoth, like in parentheses, or like, please shame. Yes, w- without Shem Hashem I've seen, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave this mystery, Chiba, for another day. It's food for thought. The one that we say in the morning, Hanoten Le'ev Koach, who gives the tired one strength. (laughs) 
Maran then writes, Yesh nohagim, then halacha zayin, there are some who have a custom, levarech barachot acherot, nosafot alenu. They have extra blessings, more than the ones that I've mentioned, v'ta'utu bi'adam, and it's a mistake in their hands. Which other barachot? Look at Ted Vav under the two lines. Yesh ma'geonim v'arishonim, there are some of the geonim and the rishonim, she'izkiru barachot nosafot, b'varachot ha'shachar. Kagon, for example, they have one magbiha shefanim. Or Somech Nofenim. That even though those blessings may be there in some Sidurim, those are variant texts and we don't recite those blessings. There are some Chachamim who disagree. In the footnotes on the bottom, he tells you. Of some chamim who say that if you want to make a bracha up and you like this bracha, you can make up a bracha. But that's obviously not Maran's opinion. On page 357, all of these blessings, if he's not obligated on any of them, let's say you didn't hear the rooster in the morning. Or he didn't walk. Or he didn't get dressed. Or he didn't wear a belt. Or he didn't wear a belt. You skip that blessing and you say it without Hashem's name. So you heard the rooster today? No. According to Maran, you don't recite the blessing with Hashem's name. You didn't wear a belt today? So you don't recite that blessing with Hashem's name. That's what Maran says. Rama writes, V'yesh omrim, and some say, D'afilu lo netchayev bahen mevarechot. And even if you were not obligated in them, and you didn't hear them, you didn't do them, you still recite them. De'en ha-berecha dafka al atzmo. Because the blessing is not on yourself. You bless, bless, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, thank you for creating this need that the world has, for roosters, for belts, for clothes, whatever it is. That is the custom, you should not change this custom. Meaning, it's one of those few places where the Ramah is telling you, don't follow Maran. Okay, so now I know why the Ashkenazim recite all the blessings. Yes? What about the Sfaradim? Under two lines, Minhag Israel is the custom of the Jewish people to recite all of the morning blessings. Even in a situation where you're not obligated to them at all. You didn't hear the rooster. Or you didn't wear clothing. Or you didn't wear a belt. And the rule is wherever there's a Minhag to say a blessing, we don't say not to say a blessing in the case of a minhag. You see how happy I am with this other half? I'm not happy. What am I supposed to do? No, Maran has a definite answer. And the Ramad definitively disagrees. And the Sephardim say there's a minhag. Who cares what Maran says? So when Ashkenazim tell us they have a minhag that violates Shulchan Aruch, we say, hey, how can you have a minhag that goes against Shulchan Aruch? But when a Sephardim have a minhag that goes against Shulchan Aruch, ah, it's a very important minhag. Double standards? Absolutely. What can I tell you? That's all I can tell you. Okay, let's leave it at that, Kevin. And I mean, I have a question about the bracha related Please. to what you just said. That is it that we say the bracha to thank God for the specific things the bracha are related to, like Oter Yisrael Basif Ara is relating to wearing a hat. Um. Is it that you're thanking God for like, giving you a hat to wear? Or is it more like you're thanking God for like crowning Israel with splendor in 
maybe a more spiritual way or in a different kind of way. And that putting on your hat just is like a reminder, like it's a trigger to make you remind you of the larger concept. That's a that's so a three way, a three way machaloket among the rishonim how you understand bekot hashachar. And he in his footnotes deals with this at length, uh, beginning on page three fifty seven. In Tedzain, meaning, is it about just it's Hakadosh Baruch we're thanking him, and is it something that's inspiring us to do it? I mean, that would really mean. So, do we have to he- do we have to hear the rooster to thank Hashem for creating the rooster? Is that really the- that's your question? There's a whole yeah. a whole long footnote about it, starting on page three fifty seven and ending on page uh, three hundred and fifty nine at the bottom. So, if you have some extra time, you're welcome to do it. Let's just say for now, Pam, it's a machloket. That's all I can tell you. It's a machloket. You may have heard that on a fast day, look on page 363, 2. That on a fast day, you shouldn't recite the blessing over wearing shoes. Because, like, I mean, a fast day like Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. Because, Shasari Kod Sofi, very good. Yeah. So he writes on page 362 that that is the opinion of the Mukubalim. Nonetheless, according to Pshat, it seems you do recite this blessing. And he says that Chacham of Uday Yosef used to say the blessing, but he would make sure that that night after the fast was over, he would put on his shoes. Right. Well, these brachot don't seem to work on halachic days, or else you would recite them before Aghavit or something. They seem to have to do with waking and sleeping days. Yeah. Let's look at the bottom of page 362 in the middle, meaning, but the bottom of the top notes. Let's say you forgot to recite these blessings in the morning. Whatever reason, you were running to catch your flight, you forgot, whatever it was. You can recite the Berkot HaShachar the whole day. Until sunset. Aside from Elohim Neshama and the blessings over the Torah, because you don't recite those blessings after you pray Shachrit. We're going to talk about this soon. Why not? But everything else, even though they're called the morning blessings, yeah, you should say them in the morning. But if you didn't say them in the morning, you can say them at any time of day that you're able to actually get to and say them. Right, that's the first understanding here. That's what the Gemara seems to imply. Yes, Marlene. So if you have to say it any time during the day before sunset, then how the how could um, putting on your shoes after sunset be a fulfillment of what you just said in your blessing? It's not my mean hug, so I don't know how to answer that question. We'd have to look and see why the people who do that do it that way. There is an obligation. What happens if a person prays in their pajamas? Let's give you an example. Law then if someone's in a hospital, they can't get dressed. Well the medical requirement though is not for this festival unless they're like medically ill or something. Right. So those are, a person's tefillot still are accepted if they're not dressed properly. There's a separate mitzvah to get dressed in honor of a Kadosh Bahu. He called Nikat and Ohecha Israel. Maran, chapter 70, 71. Maran writes this. But then at the day, you're talking about a person who clearly. This is a person forgets all Birkot HaShachar, Birkot HaTorah, it's because they're not. Something's not in order in their life. They're rushy, they're chaotic, they're whatever it is. There's a scenario that's more likely, which you might question whether you should say Birkot HaTorah or not Birkot HaShachar. Page 363. Hamashkim lakum kodam alot HaShachar. Let's say you wake up before dawn. Why would you wake up before dawn? You catch a flight, you're praying shachit to the Netzach and you don't have a mind to go back to bed. So it's not like you woke up for a glass of water, or you woke up to go to the bathroom and go back to sleep. You woke up now to wake up. Or you work at 4 o'clock in the morning over there. There's some people like that also. If it's after midnight, mevarech kol bekod hashacha. Over there is the only one who has the right to fall asleep in the class. 
But he doesn't. He, says he doesn't. He's allowed to. He says all of Birkot HaShachar. Then, Sarich Lehamtin Adalot HaShachar, you do not have to wait until dawn. As long as it's after midnight, you recite those blessings when you wake up. But before midnight, you don't recite the morning blessings. Even if you slept real sleep in your bed. You really went to sleep for a few hours. Now you woke up before midnight, you don't. You wait until after midnight to recite the blessings. You'll notice... Regular Sephardic Sidur here, we took all of them downstairs. You'll notice that in a Sephardic Sidur, before you have the morning blessings, what do you have sometimes? Sometimes. Okay, what does the Sephardic Sidur start with? You open it up, what does it start with? I can't be, I don't have one in here. No, no, I, I, digital ones are different because they're meant to be practical. Who's that? Okay, Mudani, then what? It says Mudani, and that's where they start that's when Mudani starts. Okay, what happens after the morning brachot? Ah, what what what's the kun rachel now? Yeah, okay, all the morning blessings. And after the morning blessings, what's next? No, no, before it's easy. Oh, because Marlene, you're using the brown cedar we have, right? Yeah. No, don't look at that one. Okay, Tikkun Rachel and Tikkun La. What is that? Hey, those are Tifilot you say. Tikkun Chatzot. They're midnight prayers. To say the prayers at midnight, when do you wake up? Okay, likely if you wake up before midnight, you would first say Tikkun Chatzot and then the morning blessings. But likely because you're waiting until after midnight to start saying Tikkun Chatzot. Even though you don't say it when you wake up, but before you say Tikkun Chatzot, you say, you say, the morning brachot. After, after, you have to wait till Chatzot to say Tikkun Chatzot. So the first thing you do before you say Tikkun Chatzot is you say the morning blessings. Okay, so if you wake up before midnight, you say Tikkun Chatzot, right? You can't say Tikkun Chatzot before midnight. It can only be said after midnight. So when you say it, you're saying after midnight, after midnight you're obligated in saying the morning blessings all over again. No, the people who wake up for Tikkun Chatzot, they don't go back to sleep. So now you come to the Beda Knesset in Elul. It's time for Selichot. I'm not talking about the midnight one. We say Selichot at 6 o'clock in the morning. So you normally think, I'll say stichot, then I'll say the morning blessings, and I'll pray shacharit, right? Morning, right? Yeah, say the morning brachot first. Because after midnight, you're planning to stay up. Say the morning blessings then. I think that an hour stichot, that's how it is. That has the morning blessings before stichot. Double check, but I think that's the case. Okay, what about if you wake up in the middle of the night just to drink a cup of water? 
you're going to go back to sleep. Do you have to say all the morning blessings? After chatzot, it's after midnight. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. You're just getting up to drink and go back to bed. Do you need to say the morning blessings? No, why? You're not planning to stay awake. That's right. What if you go to sleep in the middle of the afternoon? You just go take a nap. And you wake up. Like uh, some people I know in uh, Muncie, New York, they sleep for six hours Shabbat afternoon. They wake up. I heard, I heard that our custom is to, or our halakha is to at least wash your hands when you wake up. You have to wash your hands. The question is, do you say the morning blessings? No. What if you're awake the whole night and you don't go to sleep at all? Shavuot night. Shavuot night. You don't sleep. When do you say Birgot HaShachar? After midnight or at dawn? Very good. At dawn. That's, that's really when the next day. And the same thing regarding the blessings of the Torah. I'm done, that's right. Do you have to say Brakota Shaka standing or sitting? When you say Rukhada Shacha, maybe you should sit. Rabbi Chaim Palaji says, sit and focus. Sometimes go to me. I was now, I was, uh, I don't want to tell you where I was. I prayed in Ashkenazi Minyan. It had been years since I prayed with Ashkenazi. I'm not telling you where I was. No. I don't pray anywhere in town. I value my life way too much. So I was somewhere. And I walked to the Minyan, and I felt like I walked into the Greyhound station in Manhattan. <laughs> Nobody stayed in their spot. Like everyone's doing walking here, walking there, walking forward, walking backward, shuckling, bouncing, jumping, moving, whistle. The whole room was moving. How are you supposed to have Kavanah in a room of people that are taking walks? If you want to take a walk in the morning, before Shacharit, after Shacharit, but in the middle of Shacharit. You have a chair. Sit in your chair. Why are you walking around in circles? If you last too long, so leave. You don't have to wasn't forcing you to stay the whole time. You want to get up, walk outside. Go outside the Beit HaKnesset, walk in circles. But in the Beit HaKnesset, I'll tell you, it's like uh, you can get run over there. People walking forward, backwards, forward, back, forward, the whole Tevila. How do they have Kavana? People shackle like crazy people. They taught them that this is how you, is how you have Kavana. Somebody would come in from an ambulance service, they would think that all the Jewish people are having seizures. And no offense to people who really struggle with seizures. It doesn't look like normal people. Crazy people pray like that. You're sitting in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Sit straight. Sit up. Focus on your sidu. Stop moving. Stop running. Stop walking. Stop jogging. Stop just, I don't know, skipping in the aisles. You can't, I, I, years, and I've been, I'll tell you, years it had been since I prayed in the Minyan of Ashkenazim. But they gave me to do Hagbaha. And everything for me was, I, I didn't realize. I didn't know how long it's been since I lifted a Torah and how many rows you have to open and which directions. You, I didn't know. But the moving has got to stop. So Rabbi Chaim Palaji says, Say Birkot HaShachar sitting down, focused. Harav Peretz's opinion, Chalmud Yosef says you could say Birkot HaShachar sitting down too. Harav Peretz's opinion is that you say Birkot HaShachar, the blessings over the Torah, standing up, with the awe and the respect as if you're receiving the Torah now in Hasinai. You say, Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, v'natan lanu et Torah Torah. These are the most powerful blessings we have. When a man gets an aliyah. I never understood why men mumble when they say the Birkot HaShachar. Birkot HaTorah. They go, Baruchud Adonai HaMevorach. Say it out loud. I want to hear it. Why are you saying it to yourself? Why are you keeping the Birkot? All the goodness you keep to yourself. 
Say it out loud. Asher Bachar Natan Lano Torato, Torat and Mej, Ron Adab, He gave us life. This is a blessing of life. Say it out loud. Have a parent's attitude to say this blessing standing up, but according to Halakha, if you say it sitting down, there's really nothing wrong with that. Let's read one last Halakha in this chapter. Maran says in Halakha Tet, Lo yikra pesukim, you should not read pesukim, kodem birkat ha-Torah, before you recite a blessing on the Torah. Why not? Why not? You know the answer. You haven't blessed over the Torah first. How can you learn Torah before you bless on it? Maran says, Even if you're not studying them, but you're praying them. You're praying the Pesukim. Yes? When you come to the Bidah Knesset, Hodu la donai kiru vishmo diu baami mali lota. When you say that, you're learning Torah or you're praying Torah? You're praying it. You would think, okay, so I don't have to say Birkota Torah first because I'm not actually reading it, I'm just praying it. No. Nonetheless, as Maran, you have to say Birkota Torah first. The Yeshomrim and some say, She'en lachosh, that you don't have to worry. Kevan she'en omara mela derech tachanunim. That you're not actually reading them and studying them, you're only praying them, and because of that, it's not a problem. V'nachon nachosh disvara rishona. And it makes sense to worry about the first, I mean, even if you hold like the second opinion that it's okay, you might be saying words of Torah without permission, it's better to follow the first opinion. Says the Ramah, Aval hamin hag kisvara acharona. The minhag is like the second opinion, not like the first opinion. So what is Maran's opinion? Can you pray Pesukim before you say Berkat HaTorah? Maran. No. According to the Ramah, yes, Shaharei Bimea Sedichot, because you find in the days of Sedichot, Mit Palelim HaSedichot V'achar Kach Mevachim Al HaTorah Im Seder Shaham Barachot. It says, look by the Ashkenazim, that we first say Selichot, which are full of Pesukim. Yes? Especially Ashkenazim Selichot are full of Pesukim. And then we only say the Berachot after the Selichot. V'chen b'chol yom, and also every day, k'shnechnasim le Knesset, when we enter the Knesset, omrim kama Pesukim v'tachanunim. We say all kinds of Pesukim. V'achal kach mevachim ala Torah. And then you say a blessing over the Torah. Which Pesuk do you recite when you walk into the Knesset? Very good, that's one pasuk. What else? Achanan, you know a pasuk? Sleeping? Vani. In the morning, what pasuk? Vani. Say it loud, come say it loud, come, come, come. Yes, 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 I don't hear. Vani. Very good. What does it mean? And I, and I, thanks to you, your great chesed with me, Hashem. I come into your home. I'll bow down to your holy hechal. In awe of you. Sefaradim, haminag, every time you walk in the Bala Knesset. ואני ברוב חסדך, אבוא ביתך, אשתך, ודאו, אל אחד קודשך, בירתך גאון צי. Just like you wouldn't walk into somebody's house without knocking first. You don't walk into the house of a Kadosh Bochu without knocking first. Yeah? Yeah, פסוקים. So says the Ramah, you see that we say these פסוקים, 
before we say the morning blessings, because the custom of the Ashkenazim is to say the morning blessings in the Bera Knesset. Very good. And so they're saying all of these Pesukim before they come to the Bera Knesset. That's at the end. That's the end of the Vina. When they say it, Vina. Besof ma? No, they say Altira mi pachet pitom, but they don't say Vani Bob has the Hadin. But they don't say Vani Bob has the Hadin. In the morning, when you also mean Chai, whenever I walk on the Bedakan, they say Bob Hadin every time. Do you know what kind of chesed it is that a Kadosh Bahu allows you to come to his house whenever you want? What does Esther Malka say to Mordechai? He says, go ask Mordechai, go ask Achash to help the Jewish people. What does she tell him? Yeah, if I enter without permission, he could kill me. If you right now were to go to the White House, you, you elected a president democratically. He works for you. He's your employee. You wanted right now to go to the White House or walk into the White House and say hello to the president. What would happen to you? But he works for you. You're his boss, No. Who voted for him? I don't ask that. I'm not asking who voted. I don't know what I mean. Who voted the president? You, the people, voted the president. The people have to ask permission to go see the president? Yeah, that's how it works. Imagine a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You didn't vote for him. He doesn't need your vote. He doesn't care. And you can come inside of his house whenever you want. You don't have to do anything. Wash your hands, come inside. Any time of day you can wake him up. He does not sleep. He doesn't rest. There's no hours you can't call him. If someone really understands tefillah, you'll understand it's the greatest kindness that Kadosh Baruch ever gave to us. The only other one I can think of, Teshuvah. Teshuvah means that you can fix something you did wrong. Nowhere else. We don't believe in Teshuvah. You and I, we don't believe in Teshuvah. You believe that a criminal, once he does his teshuvah, he's not a criminal anymore? Of course you think he's a criminal. How can Baruch does it treat you like a criminal? Comes Yom Kippurim. Adonai shamati shimachai yareti. I heard your name, I became full of fear. I did teshuvah, HaKadosh Baruch You leave out of the Bera Knesset a new person. Never does HaKadosh Baruch hang your averot over your head again. Teshuvah and tefillah are the two greatest things that the Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us. So at least when you come into his house, I come inside because you are so kind to me. You're so nice to me that you let me feel at home here. Uh, he once came to visit the soldiers in Israel after they conquered the tomb of the patriarchs. And there were a bunch of Israeli soldiers there. And they just won the battle, and they had their shirts off, and their shoes off, and they had fans on, and they were drinking, and they were laughing, and some were sleeping on the floor, and they were playing cards, smoking. And Chamor Khadiyahu came to visit them, to congratulate them on their victory. And the Arab caretaker of Marat HaMakhbila, he started screaming at them, Ah, look at you, you Israeli soldiers, you come here, you take off your shirts and your shoes, and you smoke and you drink, and look how much you disrespect this place. Chamor Nechadiyahu couldn't hold it in. He turned around and said, listen to me. You stole this place. So because you stole it, you're very careful not to make the people who are buried here offended by dressing nicely. No. So Am Yisrael, they're the children of the people who are buried here. You can imagine if your mother didn't see you for 2,000 years and suddenly you came home. You think she cares if you're wearing a shirt or you're not wearing a shirt or she cares if you're smoking or not smoking. She just wants to see you. That's the soldiers of Israel compared to you. A ganav is a ganav. A person who this belongs to them belongs to them. We're lacking this type of leadership, by the way. To be able to call a spade a spade. This is my place. I let you. You want to find, but this is my place. I'm not. I don't apologize to you for existing here. To have chesed, Hakadosh Baruch does chesed for us. V'nahagu l'sader berkat haTorah miyad achar berkat asher yetsa. We say the blessings over the Torah immediately after the blessing of Asher Yatzar, Ve'en Neshanot, says our man, and you should not change that minhag. V'tov lomar b'shacharit, 
אחר שמע ישראל, ברוך שם כבוד מלכותו לעולם ועד. And it's important in the morning after you say שמע ישראל, which שמע ישראל is he talking about? The one before the Tevila. You know this one? The one at the beginning of the Sidhu, before we get to the Tevila part. Right, very good. So he says, but one of the most beautiful Tevilot we have is that Tevila. Why should we say there? Because sometimes what happens is that the community takes too long to get to Shema Yisrael. We have this problem here. We have this problem here. I've been making a point in the last couple of months to get here on time always. But even if we start on time, there are winter, some Shabbatot, for example, where even if we start exactly on time, we'll never make the Shema Yisrael at the right time. Will be the right thing to do in those months is to pray earlier. What can you do? For two months you have to pray early. What are you supposed to do? What? We're not there yet. But at least, says the Ramah, that when you say that early Shema, you should say it, having in mind, I'm saying Shema early, so that even if I get to the later Shema at the wrong time, at least I said Shema Yisrael at the right time today. And you obviously have to have Kavanah for that, right? By this pasuk, Baruch Shem Kevon Malchuton Leonam Ve'ed. How do you say it? Where are the commas? Al-Khanan, how do they do in school? Al-Khanan, you still awake? Yeah? Yeah. They say, Shema Yisra Eloheinu Adonai Echa. Now say Baruch Shem Allah. How do they say it? No, Baruch, Shem. Yes, yeah, so they break up the Pasuk into three parts. Baruch, Shem. Kevod, Malchuto. Laonam, Ve'ed. The right way to do it, though, is Baruch, Kama. Shem, Kevod, Malchuto, Kama. Laonam, Ve'ed, period. And the same thing in the morning. Mode, Ani. Mode, Ani. Achana. Mode, A. Melechai Bi Nishmati That's all the schools say Bechem La Raba Emunatecha That's not right Bechem La Kama Raba Emunatecha You have to say the Kama in the right way So for example If I say um, If I would say Yitzchak Can you please pass me the water yeah, what does it mean? What am I asking for Yitzchak? For the water. For the water. But if you say, Yitzchak, can you please pass me the water? What would you think about the way that I speak? Something's wrong with me. Yitzchak, can you please pass me the water? Why are you talking like that? Imagine how Kadosh Baruch Hu feels when we speak to him, putting all the parentheses and all the commas in the wrong place. It's very enough of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's exactly right. And so at the very least, I suggest you get yourself a sidu. Most of our sidurim are good with this. That have all the commas in the right place. Like that. At least, when you're reading it, you know you're, at least you sound like you know what you're talking about. Maybe you don't know what you're talking about, but at least you sound like you know what you're talking about. And sometimes I hear people read, and from the way they read, you realize they have no clue what they're saying. No, I'm not picking up people who don't understand the Hebrew. It's the letter. Even the people who are Israelis, for example, that are really have no idea what they're saying. I see this a lot when they read Haftarot and things like that. Clearly, he's like so, so happy in this time of that. This Haftarah is telling you it's going to kill you, it's going to wipe you out, it's going to destroy you. You're busy singing it like it's Halel on the Rosh Chodesh. <laughs> Be sad on this Pasuk now. And the next one, where it's all about celebration, redemption, he's busy crying. Like he doesn't have any clue. Is there any idea? How long are we going to pray the Sidhu instead of reading the Sidhu? To know what we're saying. How do you know what you're saying? You have to learn. How do you learn? You do it once. Or you pray with the Hebrew English Sidhu. You practice, you practice, you practice. Ultimately, you'll know it. But how long? I have a bird at home. He knows some words. Hi, Mimi. Hi, Mimi. He, he knows what he says? He doesn't know what he says. He doesn't know what he says. 
Nobody thinks that a parrot actually understands what he's saying. I saw this week a parrot who speaks Spanish. Everybody, wow, a parrot, he speaks Spanish, unbelievable. A parrot can speak whatever you wanted to speak. There was a parrot I saw in the store here. This parrot, he speaks gibberish. What does it mean? He heard his owner clearly had some kind of speech. He goes, like someone's talking in the, but oh, that's all he heard. So he, speak, he doesn't speak. But Jewish people shouldn't pray the way that a parrot talks. They should pray the way they understand. It's very good if a person prays in a language they understand. Sometimes it's better. Now, it's harder maybe. It doesn't match with the community. There are good Sidurim today that have word-by-word -word translations. But to never imagine all the Torah that we learn, and we never learn the Sidur. Let's learn what it means. <laughs> oh, let me see if there's any other notes I missed on this section of Shulchan Aruch. All the old school Savardim were like that. They'd correct the living daylights out of you. I'll tell you the truth is, that's how people learn. I'm not sure, though, that the aggression in which they correct people is the right way to do it. Yeah, I think that there's a way to update that type of aggression. But at the end of the day, it's important. If you it's important. What we say is important. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine if you intonated words in English the way you do in Hebrew. Imagine reading this you do in English. I'll tell you sometimes, I can read something in Spanish. How? Because I can read Latin characters. But it's obvious to anybody who's listening to me reading, I have no clue what I'm saying. Yeah. I speak like 17 words in Spanish. Most of them have to do with move here, clean there, uh, please don't kill me, and uh, I'm sorry. Like I know a few things. That's a few words I know. But when it comes to you reading, this, I can read the whole Tanakh in Spanish. But I don't understand a blessed word. Imagine that that's the way, the way I read Spanish is the way many of us read Hebrew. We want to change that. Just because we can read the letters doesn't mean that forever we should just be reading letters. I'm motivating you. I'm not hurting you. I'm not knocking you. I'm motivating you. It's time, one by one. You take one month, one month at Tefillah. So this month, Baruch Shama. Practice to know what it means. No, I look at the English translation of the Sidur and I get scared. I, I feel, I, for sure I'm in church. I look at the English prayers on the side of the Sidur and I look at it and I say, you just made King James very happy. He was very proud. And it's unbelievable because the you're reading words like sometimes like the hallelujah is a like beautiful word. Like the, then I praise thee with us. Oh my gosh, I praise nobody. I don't know what you're talking about. And, or like sometimes the words again fires and uh, sulfite and all kind of. What are you saying? Yeah, sometimes the person has to say chalas with the English, and and I have to learn more Hebrew. That's okay. I'm not talking about speaking Hebrew. The more awareness of the Hebrew that I'm reading. So to make sure that we have the Sidhu in front of us and to practice. Say, this month is my month I'm going to learn what Baruch Shama means. Every word in Baruch Shama I'm going to remember. Just a whole month. That's only Tefillah. Next month you learn Lashley Yashvah And then every year you'll do 12 Tefillot. By the time you're done, you'll be done. Doug, show me the Sidhu. This is the one I have. It's a word by word one, right? Yeah, I think the translation is really good. It's very up to date. It's not... I've had, I look at other ones, and this one's actually pretty good. Is that the one made in Baltimore? Yes. Yeah, that's why. You know why you should always look? When I, when I have a chance, I have like a few English translations, I always go to the more uh, Haredi Yeshivish translation than the academic one. You know why? Tell me why. Because the Yeshiva guys don't speak English. So they have a very weak English vocabulary. Because of that, the words they use, I understand them. What do I mean to say? It's more like a spoken English than a written English. And so even though the translation is not as accurate, but it's a lot more understandable than some of the English translations that I see in the Sidurim or the Chumashim. So it's like a lower quality English, but that sometimes it's more understandable. You understand what I'm saying? Mitoch from their bad part you hear their good part okay. if they knew too much English then they would uh, they would write bad translations of Sidui until next week we're going to take a break here next week we're going to try to run through all of Birkota Torah on, on Tuesday 
and I'm, and I'm hoping. Yeah, one second, one second, and I'm hoping that on Thursday we will um, get through the last two chapters in this book, so that right after Pesach we will start the book that actually arrived already. It's at my house. Everybody's books are here. I will send out a form so you can tell me exactly how many you ordered and everything else. And uh, Bezat Hashem, we should learn Torah and be successful and finish many more volumes of Torah. And so I'm going to, that's exactly what we announce right now. Um, I am going to have a whole...